This is a male with a complete androgen receptor defect. Just because you have a Y chromosome doesn't make you a full male. I wasn't prepared to find that I was a true hermaphrodite and that my sex had been changed and that, that my parents had a, a son who was me who had been changed into a girl. I'm an intersexed person. I'm intersexed in my brain. I'm intersexed in my body. I'm intersexed in my identity. Here we are going to reconstruct this child as a female. No matter how hard my parents tried to perm my hair, no matter how hard my parents said, you look, you look so cute in that dress. I never, ever, ever felt female, but I don't feel male either. I'm neither, I'm both. is that sometimes it's not a boy or a girl. Sometimes it's something other than that, something between those two. Pink or blue. When the sex of their new baby isn't immediately obvious, parents are shocked. Parents are devastated. Uh, and uh, we have to work with them. Uh, it's uh, the first question that a parent is asked. Did you have a boy? Did you have a girl? Uh, it's very, very difficult, and sometimes we cannot give that answer. Tests to help clarify the baby's sex can take days, even weeks, and when they come, the answers aren't always clear. Whether we are male or female, Dr. Glassberg explains, all embryos begin with the same basic parts. Developing within that gender we start out all the same. And most parents don't understand that the penis and the clitoris are the same organ, and that the uh, outer labia are the same as the scrotum. We all start out the same way, and uh, we have to understand that uh, the body can make an error. Until about six or seven weeks after conception, fetal genitalia are identical in both boys and girls. Then, if the baby is a boy, a gene on the Y chromosome causes the gonads to develop into testes. If there is no Y chromosome, the gonads develop into ovaries. But the remaining steps are driven primarily by the embryo's sex hormones, not its chromosomes. At about nine weeks, a male fetus begins to produce testosterone, which masculinizes the body. Without testosterone, the genitals maintain their feminine appearance. But there are variations at every step along the way, and some children are born with mixed sexual characteristics in what is called an intersexual birth. That female baby has more male hormones than she should have, and suddenly her sexual organs develop more masculine. And they, look, they can look a slight enlargement of a clitoris, or a clitoris that looks like a penis. I would like to bring to your attention today this three-year-old boy who came to the doctor's attention as having no palpable testicles. It was soon realized that this little boy was not a little boy, that this little boy had two X chromosomes, and that this little boy had congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, there are dozens of conditions that can cause intersexuality, and just as many physical variations. So it could be somebody who has ovaries and testicles. It could be somebody who just has testicles, but is not virilized enough so that the penis did not develop uh, normally. It could be somebody who has both a vagina and something that looks like a penis. So there's all variations. And it's not as rare as you might think. As many as one in every 2,000 children are born with ambiguous genitalia. 
approximately 65,000 babies a year worldwide. I was born in 1956. I was my parents' first child. And when I was born, um, I know now from, have, from having spoken to my mother that everyone in the delivery room fell silent. And it was clear that something was horribly wrong. And they wouldn't tell her what it was. And they wouldn't let her see me. Three days went by while the doctors pondered the baby's ambiguous genitals. And eventually they decided to label me a boy without having even looked carefully. Um, if they had looked, they would have easily noticed that I had a uterus. Though doctors weren't aware of it at the time, Cheryl Chase is what is called a true hermaphrodite. The term comes from the ancient Greek myth about a god named Hermaphrodite, who possessed both male and female genitals. In fact, I didn't have two sets of genitals. What I had was a very large clitoris. But to the doctors, the baby appeared to have a penis, and time was running out. The parents were demanding to see their baby. And they told my parents that I had um, micropenis and undescended testes, and that there wasn't anything that they could do about it. And they sent my parents home. The decision was made. The relieved parents named their new baby Charles, and life went on. But when Charlie was 18 months old, his parents, still uncomfortable with his unusual genitals, consulted a new specialist who admitted the toddler to the hospital for a sex determination. They started with a chromosome test. Chromosomes are bundles of genetic information that largely determine who and what we are. In a normal male, every cell in the body is XY. In a female, every cell is XX. Some people, including some intersexuals, have both, what is called a mosaic pattern. The tests revealed that Charlie's chromosomes were XX, female. You can't stop there. There's more to it. People think that your sex chromosomes determine your sex, and it's not so. There are XX males, and there are XY females. That's because our hormones, the body's chemical messengers, can in many ways override our genetic sex. For example, if the fetus produces too much testosterone at a critical time in its sexual development, an XX female can appear masculine. Too little testosterone, or an inability to respond to it, can keep an XY male from virilizing, creating genitals that appear feminine. And as to how we feel about ourselves. There is a theory that the only reason people turn out to feel like boys and act like boys or to feel like girls and act like girls is because people treat them that way. Since the 1950s, based on work done in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins Hospital, doctors have believed that nurture is key. Basically, what we're saying is that uh, gender identity and uh, sexuality is flexible. Howard DeVore was a doctoral student at Johns Hopkins in 1984 and co-authored a paper about the success of early gender reassignment. He has since changed his mind. <laughs> Until about 18 months of age, the theory goes, the gender of a child can be imprinted in much the same way as language. Each of us is born with the capacity to learn a language, but the one we learn depends on which language we are exposed to. <laughs> but is the theory true? Cheryl Chase doesn't think so. Being born intersex was, was going to be painful for me and my family, but it didn't have to be anywhere near as, as painful as it has been. And although the people who made it that way didn't in, 
they're not evil and they didn't intend to hurt us. Um, that was the outcome. Because doctors judged baby Charlie's penis too short ever to have satisfactory sex, mm -hmm. okay. the assignment of female was a better choice, they told his parents. They got permission from my parents to do surgery, and they opened up my abdomen and had a look and said, mm -hmm, yeah, that's what we thought. These are basically female genitals, and the clitoris is large, and it's not male genitals at all. And the only problem with this kid really is that the clitoris is so large. So they close up my abdomen, and immediately removed my clitoris. At the age of 18 months, much of Cheryl's capacity for physical sensations of pleasure had been cut away. They came out of surgery and they told my parents, you don't really have a boy, you really have a girl. And you should change your boy's name to a girl's name and change to one that sounds similar so that he won't notice you did that. And keep him in diapers all the time so he won't notice that we removed part of his genitals. And move to another town and don't tell anybody where you went. And while you're moving, go through all your possessions and find everything that refers to his existence and eliminate it. Get rid of birthday cards, baby pictures, home movies, letters, everything. And um, just raise her as a girl. She's going to be fine. She's going to grow breasts when she's a teenager, and she's going to menstruate, and she's going to marry and have grandchildren for you. And everything is going to be hunky-dory. And so the toddler's name was changed from Charlie to Cheryl. Forty years later, at University Hospital in Brooklyn, a couple we'll call Rick and Tina had their first child. I just wanted a healthy baby. It didn't matter whether it was a girl or a boy for us. We just wanted a healthy baby. And then Saturday morning, 2.30 a.m., I delivered. When the doctor announced the baby was a girl, Tina was elated. I was so happy. But moments later, the doctor hesitated. They said, it's a girl, and they said, oh, wait a minute. That was, that was how it went. I didn't hear anything till like, the next day. And um, then they came and explained to me that, you know, it, it could be a boy. How do we assign gender, and how do we determine what is the gender of that individual? Well, typically in the past, it was defined by the microscope. The chromosome and hormone tests that will help to clarify the baby's sex can take days, even weeks. In the meantime, new parents Tina and Rick wondered, what were people to be told? And uh, that was very, very difficult. There was people waiting on the phone while I was in labor, you know. And they all wanted to know what the baby was. So. My answer machine was, like, filled. And the problem is a pressing one. Birth certificates need to be filled out. Is the baby male or female? How this question is answered shapes the baby's entire life. I told my mother, just tell him it's a girl. Tell him it's a girl, eight pounds, nine ounces. If it turned out later that the baby was a boy, well, the couple decided they would face that when they had to. The baby was sent to intensive care, and Tina and Rick were left to worry. Katrina was born with only two openings. She didn't have a vaginal canal. It was like where the vagina, vaginal canal was supposed to be, it was like fused over with skin. It was just a smooth skin area, nothing there. It took about a week or better to find out exactly the sex. Shortly after birth, a team was assembled to assess the sex of the baby. The first question was, what are the baby's chromosomes? They did the chromosome testing, and she was XX, which is female. But that wasn't the whole story. They explained to me that her adrenal gland was malfunctioning, that it would cause her hormones to go, to escalate, to elevate. Just weeks after conception, 
the baby's adrenal glands located on top of her kidneys started producing abnormally high levels of hormones that began to masculinize her body. The baby has a genetic condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH. We know uh, that uh, the patient with congenital adrenal hyperplasia has been exposed in the womb, in, the, in fetal life, to male hormones because uh, that little uh, female fetus, her adrenal gland was making male hormones. It looks like an elongated urethra. This is part of the urethra inside. After nine days of tests, it was official. The doctors agreed with Tina and Rick. Their baby was a little girl. We'll call her Katrina. She was started on medicine to prevent her body from making male hormones and early surgery was recommended. It was obvious that her, her genitalia was enlarged, and so they explained that they were going to do reconstructive surgery. Psychologically, it's best to operate on the genitals uh, before 15 months of, uh, of age. Dr. Glassberg says early surgery is important for the parents, too. The parents have to accept that gender assignment for it to be successful. So if a parent has a little girl with a big phallus that looks like a penis, can that parent be very comfortable treating that child as a female, dressing that child in pink? Well, there's a problem with babysitters. <laughs> and they can't have babysitters. What are they supposed to say to the babysitter? You know, how open are parents uh, willing to be? And so, Dr. Glassberg <laughs> says, even when it's not medically necessary, early surgery is standard in the United States. We feel that a child to have a good gender identity has to have genitals uh, that match their identity. But it didn't work out that way for Cheryl. Her sense of whether she was a boy or a girl was never clear to her. I think I have a gender that's different from most other people, and it's not exactly male or female. As a teenager, I was very depressed, and I was very angry, and I was very withdrawn. When Cheryl started menstruating at age 13, her parents decided the ordeal was finally behind them. I think what happened was my parents were living in terror that I wouldn't turn out to be a girl. And once I menstruated, they said, that's it, you know, it worked. But nothing about her surgery was ever explained to Cheryl. Increasingly confused and uncomfortable, at 19, she decided to research her medical records. It took three years to get them, but there it was in dry medical terminology. Sex, male. Then the words true hermaphrodite, and then name changed. The family secret was out. But what had been done to her was too painful to discuss. She pushed it away. And I wasn't able to speak about it until I was 35. And, and then I was in the middle of a, of a big emotional crisis. In the eyes of the world, Cheryl was a highly successful business person, a principal in a high-tech company. She had moved to Japan and become fluent in the language. And then at 35, the demons returned. In crisis, she went to a psychologist who reassured her and set an appointment for the following week. And I headed out of her office in a fog. And um, by that night, I was working out ways to kill myself. And then when I thought that 
of how, how sad and how, how awful that was, that nobody would know what it was about. Um, I got angry, and I thought, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it in front of one of the doctors who did this to me. And I don't feel that way now, but... That, that was the key, is changing from feeling hopeless to, to feeling angry. Cheryl's breakdown became her breakthrough. She returned to the United States, moved to San Francisco, and slowly began to heal. When I decided that human feelings were something that I should get back. And when I decided that whoever I was couldn't possibly be something to be ashamed of. At 35, Cheryl began searching for other intersexuals. My name's Michael, and um, I was born with hyperspadius, and um, my urethral opening was um, mid-shaft on the underside. Tonight, a small group of intersexuals have gathered to share their experiences. At the age of eight and nine, I um, underwent a two-stage surgery in London, and um, that apparently seemed successful. The operation moved Michael's urethra to the tip of his penis, but at the age of 14, the surgery broke down. I'm, on average, I get an infection about once every six weeks. Mm -hmm. but it, it gives me a fever for about uh, three or four days, yeah. and it, it usually uh, um, does not allow me to work. Michael has just finished his doctorate in psychology, but because of his still precarious health, he's concerned about the rigors of his new internship. His wife, Ellen, is supportive. At the age of 30, I met my wife, who I'd been with for 12 years. I enjoy um, a, a pretty good sexual relationship um, with orgasm, and, um, but I, I think that I look back on my life and um, had I been given the choice um, to uh, uh, choose surgery later in my life, I, I think I would have made that choice. Doctors are always saying that they have lots and lots of satisfied patients and, and all their patients are happy and we're just a bad bunch, we're the bad apples. And mm -hmm. They've never produced anybody who's willing to say that. My name is Christy. And I'm a resident of Northern California. And I was born with partial AIS. And um, shortly after my birth, my large clitoris was removed. Partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS, is a genetic condition in which the body's cells only partially respond to male hormones. Christy's chromosomes are XY. She was born with a large clitoris, undescended testes, and no vaginal opening. She does not menstruate, and she is not fertile. At the age of 13, um, I was told by my mother that I was a hermaphrodite. When she was older, Christy's mother explained, she would have surgery to create a vagina. The Christmas of my freshman year, I went to New Orleans and had a vaginoplasty. Very, very frightened I was. Very, very frightened. But I felt I had to be strong for my family. In 1994, doctors in Louisiana did what is called a vaginoplasty, taking a piece of Christie's intestine to cosmetically create a vagina. Prior to the vaginoplasty, the destructive, barbaric vaginoplasty, I just had a, a you know, a sheath of skin, you know, that did lubricate, like the skin did lubricate, which was cool, you know? My body responded to sexual stimulation which, of course, it doesn't now, um, but it did. Uh, I went back to school, like nothing happened. But I, you know, started to slip into this, you know, you know, awful depression. As a psychologist, Howard DeVore has treated intersexed people for almost a decade. Only recently has he been willing to share his own history. I had, at the time of birth, what was later referred to as a third-degree hepaspadius, uh, which is um, basically an opening of the genitalia from the tip of the phallic structure all the way through what would have been testes or labia majora down to the rectum. 
and they decided to assign me as male within the first couple of days of life and 16 surgeries later the first at three months and the last at 23 years of age I still have fistula I still have leaks I still have strictures I still have infections and I always thought that you know the doctors had some real powerful magic out there and that um, one of these times when they peeled back the huge surgical dressing underneath that surgical dressing there would be a perfect penis you know? was there? never, never. But whatever the surgical result, our gender is infinitely more complicated than the shape of our genitals. Intersex people don't fit the categories that most doctors are comfortable with. They want people who are male or female. Every single one of us knows that we are passing as something that we know we truly are not. Every single one of us grows up coming into contact with normal boys and girls and knowing we're not quite like that. We're not quite like that. Welcome to a village in the Dominican Republic. My name is Alberto Ruiz Felix, but everyone calls me Berta. I'm 21 years old. When I was eight, I walked around in a skirt or a dress and pigtails. Just to emphasize how tricky all this chemical bodybuilding can get, there's a peculiar intersexual genetic defect called 5-alpha reductase that seems to be clustered by heredity in several small villages in the Dominican Republic. 5-alpha reductase is a uh, disorder uh, where individuals uh, cannot convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Without the hormone dihydrotestosterone, genetically XY males like Alberto are born looking more like females. They're frequently raised as females because they look like females, but as they get older, their penis grows, their testicles descend, and their identity becomes that of male, even if they were given a female identity at birth. From about nine years on, that's when I began to feel like a man. Dharma Felix is Berto's mother. She and her husband had hoped for a boy, but a girl was fine too, as long as the baby was healthy. When I bathed her in the hospital, my sister-in-law told me that she had testicles. I told her she was crazy, that she was only swollen. But then when I was bathing her, I felt a little organ inside, like a little boy's. People told me she was a hermaphrodite, a guevidoche. Literally, Webadoche means eggs at 12, because generations of villagers have thought that the young teens descending testicles resembled eggs. It's interesting that individuals raised as females, even with dresses, become males later on by their own choosing uh, very often. And that shows that these patients have been exposed to testosterone, and testosterone does have an effect on the brain. Though the mechanism isn't yet understood, many researchers believe that the baby's own testosterone washes through its developing brain, carried by nearby blood vessels. It will virilize the brain and make somebody act more like a male, in quotes. In recent years, research has confirmed what most parents have long suspected. Little boys tend to be more rough and tumble than little girls. That doesn't mean they don't join in more traditional girl games with friends. But if left to choose, boys prefer the rowdy side of the street. 
But the real difference between boys and girls is less than you might think. Each of us is a unique combination of male and female, influenced by the exact hormone bath we are exposed to before birth. The culture we are born into certainly affects our feelings, these researchers say. But as Alberto's story proves, it's definitely not the whole story. As a baby, Alberto is named Uberte and taken home to join her older sister. The first few years were fine, but by the age of seven, there was trouble. When she was born, she was a girl. And when she began to grow and I sent her to school, he didn't want to wear a dress, and he didn't want to go. I never liked to wear a dress. I did it because I was forced to. I knew from when he was small that he would be very masculine because of the way he was playing and acting. He carried trees on his shoulder like a man. He had muscles. He was very strong. She's very strong, even though she's, she's just an average size baby. She's very strong, though. Very strong. Very attractive. Very beautiful little girl. If Katrina is like most children with CAH, she may become a tomboy. <laughs> To maintain her feminine appearance, she has to take medicine to keep her adrenal gland from producing masculinizing hormones. But even with lifelong medication, Dr. Glassberg has explained to Tina that children with CAH have a 30% or higher chance of growing up to be homosexual. This according to studies reviewed by the New England Journal of Medicine. As an adult, or as a teenager, uh, we know there's a higher incidence of uh, bisexuality and homosexuality. Is that because of these male hormones when this infant was younger? Perhaps in part. But no matter how many replacement hormones Howard DeVore took, he never felt like a boy. At 14 or 15, I did the very best that I could to pass. And I exaggerated my masculinity, and um, I slept with a lot of girls and uh, a few boys, and um, tried to find some place that I fit. It was clear that I wasn't making it as a boy. I didn't, I didn't act like boys, I didn't feel like a boy. It was becoming increasingly uncomfortable to try to pull off being a boy. I thought that suicide would be a reasonable alternative. At 15, Howard says, a psychiatrist probably saved his life. But years of therapy did nothing to change how he feels about his gender. I do real good passing his boy. I take my hormones on schedule. I maintain a masculine appearance. I keep my hair a certain way. It is purposeful. Do I feel like a boy? Do my insides feel like a boy? Do I identify as a boy to my intimates? No. For the past year, Howard has been involved with Tim, who is also an intersexual. Finding each other, they say, has been a great relief for both of them. It's an incredible effort to try to pass. It's a lot of weight to carry. And I'm just not willing to carry that weight anymore. I will not live up to my false assignment as male. Alberto understands. At the age of nine, he refused to be a girl. When I looked at myself naked in the mirror, I saw myself physically as a normal girl. His body's lack of one of two major male hormones maintained Alberto's feminine appearance. My hair was very long, it came down to here. But when I was nine or ten, I had it cut off against my mother's wishes. 
At puberty, testosterone was released, causing Huberke's testes and penis to develop. Huberke. That's what they called me as a child. But when I became a man, I called myself Alberto. Now, I use a machete. That's what I do. Now I work like a man, not like a woman anymore. But even in a village culture accepting of hermaphrodites, Alberto's sudden change wasn't easy. If they appear some days as girls and other times as boys, of course they'll make fun of them. But otherwise, they are accepted around here and people feel that they can change. Misua is from the same village and is the father of ten. Three sons, three daughters, and four guevedoche, hermaphrodites. I think that parents should ask their children what they want to do, how they feel more comfortable, and then support them in their decision. As a father of four such children, I would tell them to accept it as a gift from God and not to fight it. I'm proud of him because I love my son and he loves me. I never thought this could happen to me, but you have to accept it. Despite changing cultural norms and a new scientific understanding of how gender develops, five times a day in America, doctors perform surgery on intersexual babies in an attempt to normalize the child's body. Doctors say our culture demands it. Times have changed. Times are different. We treat patients with more knowledge, with more experience, and with better surgery. And that's exactly what new parents Tina and Rick are counting on. An exploratory scope and other tests had revealed that Katrina has a uterus, ovaries, and a very enlarged vagina. This is a big vagina behind the bladder. And we see it on ultrasound over here. Uh, Katrina uh, had a problem uh, where uh, she was urinating into her vagina. And there was a very narrow connection between her vagina and her urethra. So as a result, her vagina would become very large. Surgery was planned to correct Katrina's urinary problems, widen the opening to her vagina, and if necessary, reduce her enlarged clitoris. They said when she comes to about a year to 14 months that they would consider doing the surgery. To me, I felt like that was a long way off and that was good. You know, I tried to prolong that as long as I could. Dr. Glassberg feels that surgery isn't optional. Cheryl Chase, an intersexual, agrees that Katrina's urinary problem needed to be surgically corrected. But fix just that one problem, she says. Anything further is purely cosmetic. Some children are born with conditions that are um, going to make them sick or cause pain or threaten their lives. And, and of course, those conditions, if, if they can be treated with surgery, should be treated. But large clitorises don't cause pain and they don't threaten your life. Small penises don't cause pain and they don't threaten your life. And cosmetic surgery on the genitals is um, an incredibly invasive thing to do in it. And I don't think that anyone has a right to do that to another person without that person's wishing it. But even when early surgery is cosmetic, Glassberg feels it's the right thing to do. To suddenly say to somebody, we're going to uh, make a vagina for you at 13 years of age, I think is much more traumatic. She had a surgery May 6th. What they did on her was a vaginoplasty, and they did all the inside and outside. 
Because drugs had somewhat reduced the size of Katrina's enlarged clitoris, Dr. Glassberg decided to leave it untouched. And uh, the question of us cutting nerves and so forth uh, wasn't raised, uh, wasn't an issue because I didn't have to do the surgery. But I still think when it's large and it's um, something that where the parents can't deal with it themselves, then I think it should be made smaller. And I think we still are left with a sensitive organ even when we operated on it fairly aggressively. But because Katrina's vagina was further back than they anticipated, the surgery took longer than expected. And towards the end, it was very hard for me because, you know, I just wanted to hold her. I didn't see her for hours. And I was just crying. I just want to hold my baby. That's all. At 7.10 in the evening, the baby was finally on her way to recovery. Hi. It's been a long day, but everything went very, very well. Okay, I'm, I'm very pleased. I did not have to touch the clitoris. Functionally, uh, we have a, a wide open vagina. Healing will take about six months, Dr. Glassberg explains, and a second surgery is likely when Katrina reaches puberty. We just have to accept it and be honest with the parents that a second surgery might have to be done to make the vagina wider when the child is older. A month after the surgery, Katrina is healing well, and Rick and Tina have no regrets. Sometimes that would come out that maybe we should have waited, but it probably would have just occurred later, you know. Surgery is so much better now, Dr. Glassberg says, that the horror stories of the past are only historical footnotes. Howard DeVore disagrees. These guys think that they can work miracles, that they're just magical, and that they can make things look great, and they're full of it. If you cut into skin, it scars. It becomes less flexible, and it has less feeling in it. Not one of those surgeons can deny that. When he was born with severe hypospadias, or incompletely formed genitals, the doctors could have chosen male or female. What they pressured his parents into choosing, Howard says, was unnecessary surgery. So at three months of age, I had my first surgery. I was now on a course that could not be altered. I was going to have surgery after surgery after surgery and skin graft after skin graft after skin graft forever. And his childhood was filled with pain and isolation. I was a weird kid and kids treated me like a weirdo. Um, I, I, was, I couldn't play rough if I was, if I was uh, healing from a surgery. Couldn't play in contact sports, couldn't do rough and tumble play like boys did. Each summer, almost every holiday, there was yet another surgery. And then there were the minefields of puberty. Well, <laughs> um, you learn pretty quick that you can't expose your genitals in a large group when you're a kid like me. 98 pounders, step up. You learn either to be the first one in or the last one in, so that you're not in the showers or changing at the same time as any of the other kids. By high school, it was just getting to be too much, so I learned how to hyperventilate so that I passed out. And I was excused from gym class. Sixteen surgeries later, Howard believes the operations were not only cruel, but unnecessary. The one thing I want more than anything in this life is to have been able to have had the genitals that I was born with, that God gave me, rather than what was taken from me at three months of age against my will. Nobody asked me. Um, I, I experience um, infections. Mm -hmm. People's genitals are their own, mm -hmm. and they should be left alone. Mm -hmm. My name's Hale, and my experience is a little bit different than yours. Um, when I was born, I was born with a very small penis. My parents were told that I would have to be raised as a female. And my parents balked, thankfully. Um, they thought that what they were looking at was male genitalia. Hale's parents refused to allow surgery. 
Um, nonetheless, I have a very, very happy life. Um, I'm able to um, have a fulfilling sexual life with a long-term partner, um, orgasms, and all those wonderful things <laughs> um, are, not, are not a problem. Mm -hmm. Parents, in the beginning, they think, oh my God, this is terrible, I have to do something about it. But eventually they come to some peace with it. They just do. <laughs> Mommy, you better get over here. Well, what I'd like to do is to examine her and let's see how the surgery's doing. Okay. And I, feel, I didn't feel like this was a tragedy. I didn't feel that way. To me, she was a healthy little girl. She's doing terrific. I'm very pleased. But in fact, after more than 50 years of surgery on intersexual infants, Doctors still don't know if their ex-patients are silent and happy, or silent and unhappy. So, that is the most important thing about gender assignment. You have to be comfortable with the sex that you've been assigned. Cheryl Chase and Hale Hallbecker are now lobbying Congress to stop gender assignment surgery on intersexual infants. Doctors are actually sort of the ultimate social constructionists. They actually believe, they have a formal policy at the American Academy of Pediatrics that says any child can be turned into a girl or a boy as long as we're allowed to do surgery. The Academy's official position states, research on children with ambiguous genitalia has shown that a person's sexual body image is largely a function of socialization, and children can be raised successfully as members of either sex if the process begins before two years. Dr. Glassberg is the American Academy of Pediatrics spokesperson on this issue. Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, position on all this is a somewhat evolving one, uh, but I I, I think we're still going to do our surgery if we feel it is indicated. It isn't a few vocal radicals who are saying this. It's thousands of intersex people around the world. Of the hundreds of people who I've met who are intersexed, and of probably the thousands of cases that I've reviewed, I can't find one person who is happy with their surgical result, who thinks that what was done to them by surgeons is really great and they would have done it again. Not one. Actually, neither the activists nor the surgeons have much more than anecdotal evidence. Only recently have people on both sides of the early surgery controversy pushed for better long-term outcome studies. In the meantime, Cheryl Chase says, a big step would be to tell parents that at the moment there is no reliable scientific evidence that intersex children benefit from early childhood surgery. The way that I was born wasn't something that made me physically ill. And the surgery wasn't ne necessary for any medical reason. They did it because they thought that my body was horrifying. They just looked at it and they said, ah, you can't have this. Activists are pushing doctors for a better explanation. And if the doctors say, you have a beautiful, healthy child, um, we're not exactly certain what the sex is right now, and we're going to have to do some tests to find that out. Um, and I know that this is probably um, surprising to you, and you might not have heard of this before, but I have. I've seen it many times, and I'm going to introduce you to some other parents who've been through this, and I'm going to introduce you to some adults who've been through this. Cheryl says the doctors and parents should decide together whether to label their child a boy or a girl. The baby goes home with the agreed-upon identity, but no surgery is done. I think that when the child is old enough to make a decision for themselves, which is probably sometime during adolescence, as long as they understand what the risks are, they should be allowed to request surgery if they want it, and also to say that they don't want surgery if they don't want it. I sincerely believe that the vast majority of patients we've done right by. Bye-bye, sweetie. Bye-bye.
The aims of the surgery are genuinely humanitarian, the doctors who perform them say. Sometimes, Dr. Glassberg feels, the activists don't understand that. But there were interesting and necessary questions that were being asked that we had to respond to. And I've spent hours upon hours thinking about them. We think of male and female as the great human divide, but intersexuals are teaching us just how narrow that divide can be. I have a wife and I've been married for five months. My wife knows all about my past. She knows. But she loves me. She truly loves me. This is what happens in love. There should be no shame in this. That's the way it is. What intersexuals have to teach the rest of us is the truth about all of us. That none of us, none of us fit the stereotype. None of us are Madonna, not even Madonna. None of us are Rambo, not even Rambo. There's not a chance. It isn't humanly possible. Gender, it seems, is a work in progress for all of us. As research about gender identity unfolds, the question remains, what decisions are best for the infant? We've done what we thought was best for our child, Rick and Tina say. If we've made mistakes, we'll get through them as a family. When that time comes, if it does come, that we'll be able to get over that as well. I'll be there for her no matter what. In the end, perhaps, it's our children themselves who must tell us who and what they are.